All right, welcome to welcome to the Pulling the Threads po- podcast. Uh, today I'm doing a discussion with author David LeBlanc, uh, author of There's No Such Thing as Magic Blood. We've had a few conversations on here. He used to have his own podcast. Uh, we both share some similar background when it comes to our journey, I guess, towards Judaism and out of Christianity. Uh, and so today I kind of just want to cover uh christian origins what is judaism and some of the theological errors of what became christianity messianic judaism and you know various things along the way um as an intro i kind of want to ask are you familiar with the theodosian code it's called considered a compilation of laws by the roman empire under the Christian emperors, uh, published uh, it's significant in the history of Christianity for a few reasons. One, it established Christianity as the official religion of the empire and made other uh, religions illegal. Specifically, it circum- circumscribed the rights of Jews. It elevated the status of Christianity in Europe, and it applied the term of sacrilege to apostasy, heresy, schism, Judaism, specifically paganism as well, and more. It prohibited the sale of saint relics. It is a compilation of 16 books, and its contents were eventually codified into law over time through various codes. Are you familiar with the Theodosian Code at all? No, it's the first I hear of it, and you're saying that this was instituted in the the 15th century? Uh, No, uh, it was published uh, 438 Common Era. I thought you said 1438. Okay. No, no. It's... uh, So... It was a code that was published in 438 AD. So this is post Nicene, uh, and it was was 16 books. Now, various portions of it made its way into law eventually within the Roman Empire. Um, So you're not familiar with the Theodosian Code. Um, You know, something I mentioned to uh, Dr. Price that he was was mildly familiar with. how much of the Roman imperial code making uh, Christianity an official state religion and various laws are you familiar of, of the Roman Catholicism becoming the state religion and then how it established itself and eradicated other sects and religions? How much of that are you familiar with? I'm pretty familiar with the history that of that process. I just had never heard of uh that I guess Magnus Opus statement of the church uh, regarding what you're, you're describing. I do know that for instance, that it was in the, uh, in the sixth century, I believe it was sometime in the mid five hundreds that, um, or might've even been earlier than that. I don't have the exact date, but at some point the acting Pope uh, made it illegal to pray the Shema. So it probably was in the same milieu as that entire process that you're talking about there that that's just one aspect of some of the stuff that happened um during that period it cert- certainly i know that um post constantine uh constantine really uh there's a scholar that i'm friends with oh, i haven't spoken to him in a while um my son-in-law knows him quite well but he he wrote a book um called jesus uh, the God of Jesus. That's the name of the book. The name of the book is The God of Jesus. And he basically, he's a Christian, and he researched the development of the Trinity doctrine uh, all the way back, you know, to the earliest points of Christianity that he could find. And uh, and he went through all the different, you know, movements from modalism to Valentinianism, all these different things. Uh, it was a very well, well-researched book, uh, Debunking the Trinity. Um, but in the book, uh, he also did a follow-up and his follow-up work um, uh, is all about Constantine. And uh, I haven't read that book. I've read the first one. Uh, but basically, there was clearly there was clearly an attempt by the Roman Empire, as it were, the real rulers of the Roman Empire in the later stages of it before it crumbled, uh, to really use Christianity as uh, a way of governing the people. Uh, that that much I know. Um, but what you're talking about, I, this is the first I hear of it. Uh, yeah. So it, it, I mean, it, it kind of lays it out in a more delineated, succinct thing. And as you look at the Theodosian code, there's some very specific things, uh, you know, of course, um, the 
declaring, you know, other things to be sacrilege was anything that wasn't Christianity. And that included Judaism now is sacrilege. Um, and it, you know, included the policy, the policies of, of censorship and, you know, deeming, deeming people, uh, uh, apostasy so that then they could eradicate them. Um, and so kind of to define terms before we talk about, uh, Christianity and Messianic Judaism, I wanted to define what I would consider Christianity and when Christianity as we know it came to be, which what I would say was the centuries long process that the culmination of uh, the major events are between 400 and 800 common air. Um, there was the early seabeds, but the seabeds, we don't have as much textual information. We have polemics versus, uh, against the early Jewish Christians. You know, before 400, we don't have a solid document record of what Christianity was or was not. We have to rely on the polemics of early church fathers, uh, documentary fragments. So honestly, before 400, we can't say what Christianity was with a 100% surety, and we can't say what the text of the Bible they would have used is with surety. We have the first uh, complete gospel and epistles, New Testaments, Codus Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, uh, respectively mid fourth century. Uh, and we don't have anything before that. We have fragments of epistles, uh, third and fourth century. Um, and so I would, I would put Christianity post Nicene as what we know as Christianity is really the culmination of a post Nicene thing that became the Ero a Roman official religion and through Roman imperial power, it formed what became Christianity. Uh, the leadership structure of the Roman Catholic Church, the bishops and all that came from an existing Roman governmental stru uh, structure. And even the mystery religions had the same structure, um, even all the way up to the Pope at the top. Every, every bit of structure existed in Rome and the pagan mystery religions, not Judaism. Um, so I would define Christianity as we know it and the textual tradition as we know it as a fourth century and beyond. Um, and then piecing together what it came from is gonna be a little bit of the question here. Um, but yeah, my opening question was, how did you see the formation of Christianity and its main, like when it became imperial power and it spread through Roman imperial power, how much of that, you know, are you aware of and, and what is your take on that part? Well, certainly I'm aware of that. Uh, I think one of the things that, to answer your question, my take on that is that I think one of the biggest uh, points of contention in theological debates about Christian origins um, unfortunately lately from what I've seen seems to center around Jesus historicity and Jesus mythicism um, which I think unfortunately misses the point of what you're describing uh, you don't have to have a historical Jesus for this religion to take on the scope that it did um, yeah. because the question of, of origins, as you correctly stated, in my opinion, uh, the only thing we have to go by is the writings of, of that which is left over, which, um, you know, so for instance, as an example, to a lesser degree, you have similar debates about the origins of Judaism, right? So you have, um, you have various sects within the Jewish world uh, around the Second Temple period, which don't necessarily in any way represent what later becomes Talmudic Rabbinic Judaism. Uh, mm. So what we have in Rabbinic Judaism is a similar progression of ideas uh, developed over hundreds of years uh, that you know we know as the Talmud. And we have, of course, the Jerusalem Talmud, the, you know, the, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, and that represents hundreds of years of conversation and correspondence with not only Judaism upon itself, but also its reflections upon the developing world around it. it yeah. uh, right. And so unfortunately for this conversation, it's you have 
you have the Jewish camp, you've got the Christian camp, and then you've got, uh, I guess for lack of a better way to say it, you've got the uh, impassionate or, or dispassionate observers from a distance who are watching all this, um, which I would put like modern scholarship into that camp, you know, trying to it's parse it all together. Critical. What's that? The historical critical method, people looking for historical archaeology, trying to understand it from right. a academic, secular, uh, right. what can be attested, and is it just a group's in think? I mean, what can we attest to outside of what people thought of themselves? Right, and so I think we can't talk about origins without being very aware of where the the conversation is today. So... <laughs> The conversation today is is muddied by it would be easy if we had simply if everybody weighing in on this had no horse in the race but because we don't have that problem we you know christianity and judaism continue to exist today and so we have uh, we have people weighing in from a position of bias on christianity yeah. right and, and on judaism but we're talking about christianity here um mm -hmm. So the propensity, that's the wrong word, the, um, the tendency uh, is that people tend to debate the meaning of the text without, without um, bringing the focus of the camera lens back into a wider picture of where do we get our text. And so obviously a lot of people do wrestle with that. But the average believer is not trying to question the veracity of the text. They're simply taught that this is our tradition and this is what we believe. And so that muddies the water significantly because, uh, of course, if we get past all that, we just look at, you know, the development of Christianity as, in terms of an authoritative voice in the Roman world. Uh, to me... There's layers to this. So first of all, we have to understand the significance of what we would call today regime change and how it impacted the Middle East uh, related to the Roman Empire. So you have Jerusalem as a territory state of Rome mm -hmm. at the time of supposedly the time of Jesus. And uh, at that time, the Jewish nation had been disenfranchised to a large degree, and they were they were a client state of Rome. And Rome had specific interest in the region because of the resources that it provided them. Uh, you know, so they, they were a colony of, for lack of a better way to put it, they were they, the Romans had colonized Judea. Uh, their culture was highly influential to a lot of the Jewish people in the region as well as others, uh, and you know. Uh, there was a pattern that Rome followed with its client states, which was typically to gain military and economic control. And then they had a policy of tolerance mm -hmm. of the religious beliefs of the, of the territory provided they, they gave homage to Caesar and to the Roman rulers. Uh, so provided, you know, provided you paid your taxes and, and you, and you worshiped, um caesar you could worship what anything else you wanted but just don't leave that part out and so i think you know christian origins becomes a very contentious discussion because you you really a lot of people try to do this they try to they try to isolate the textual evidence apart from the political and socioeconomic realities and socio-political realities of the very problematic. Uh, my suspicion strongly strongly uh, i strongly suspect this is that um i don't think that it's reasonable when you look back onto the roman empire of that time and how things how information got propagated so people most people including biblical scholars i would include biblical scholars in this have no clue how strongly the roman empire exerted force to control the narrative about their own empire about the religions they wanted to be promoted and we know you already alluded to it we know that there was a lot of censorship and control uh, of 
various spiritual texts of that time that related to Christianity. We know this from the discovery of the uh, Hag Hammadi corpus. We know this from many different things that have been discovered, even the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, all these different yeah. discoveries that have happened in recent times uh, have shed light upon the culture and the tenor of, of religious expectations of the time. We also know, for instance, um, that you really can't... I'm jumping around a little bit here, but just to answer your question, we know that there was no verifiable archaeological evidence of of any large christian community in the first two centuries we really yeah. don't see any archaeological evidence of christianity in rome or in its envir environs uh environs uh until like the third century that's when you start seeing buildings you start seeing churches that show up so that's the very christian strange catacombs. right what's that things like the christian catacombs in rome right so so you have um we know for instance that uh and this is uh, again this is one of the reasons why and I'm, I'm being a little tangential here but this is one of the reasons why i've come to the place where i'm rather convinced of the marcionic priority position is because we we know for a fact this is not a debatable issue we know for a fact that the, the earliest verifiable published gospel that was circulated was Marcion's Gospel of the Lord in the 130s AD. Yes. Um, so that's a fact. That's not a debatable statement. Uh, mm. What is debated is, oh, yeah, but there was a lot more that came before that, and Marcion was simply massaging what the message was that he wanted. That's the common narrative on Marcion, was that Marcion was basically plagiarizing an earlier proto-Luke and um, and he published his own thing based on his own agenda. Uh, but let's just put that debate aside for a moment. I'm just trying to simply point out by bringing that up that if you're going to have a intelligent discussion about Christian origins, you have to understand that, like like in today's day and age, if like I I I have my book right. You mentioned my book at the beginning of the podcast. So rather than go through the arduous task of trying to find an agent and getting a traditional publishing house to pick up my book and publish it. Uh, I self-published it. Uh, does that mean it's not credible? No, the information is the information, but I self-published it to expedite the process of getting it out there because it wasn't important to me to become a famous author. It was important to me to get the message out. Well, I'm able to do that as a working class person because we have the apparatus available in our society Printing is is mundane today, right? Like people print yeah. things all the time. They can publish things all over. You can publish things on the internet. So publishing a paper or publishing outside of a peer review process, publishing something is no big deal today. Publishing something back in those days took a lot of money and it took connections. Yeah. You know, the gargantuan task that was, uh, you know, to dis to produce and distribute on the scale that the New Testament eventually is distributed. It required it, government sponsorship and uh, support. At least um, connections, at least connections. I, 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 I'm talking about this because of your comments at the beginning. Uh, uh, most people, I don't think, realize that there's nothing that survives today outside of what's been discovered post-Empire. There's nothing that survives today that we can reference that wasn't allowed to survive by the government of the Roman Empire when it started to curate and censor what it, so the government of the Roman Empire when it when it became the religion of the empire they actively suppressed destroyed um, redacted which means changed uh, yeah. the literature that we're working with so I don't care what name we play. We can say, well, Irenaeus said this, or Celsus said that, or Marcion said that. Most of what we know of a lot of these characters come from the arguments which survive of their opponents. Yeah. Because their writings were destroyed or lost, or both. Um, so why did this happen? Well, it happened because Rome was a fascist state, and they didn't think twice about burning literature that they felt was not consistent with what they wanted people to read. Once the church became a Roman entity, 
it's now a government apparatus, therefore the messaging must be controlled. So I don't care if you're going back 300 years, 200 years, 100 years, 50 years, all of what we have in the New Testament and all of what we have in all the church fathers and the, and the, the, the vast corpus of uh, the umbrella, if you will, of other writings which surround the New Testament, uh, the commentaries, the apologetics, the rebuttals, everything else, uh, they all exist in this vacuum of Roman censorship and whatever has leaked through is combed over and we're, we're left with nothing but speculation as to what was the original. Uh, a perfect example of this, just to illustrate the point, uh, for example, I, I found one of the most helpful books I ever read, because uh, I was always fascinated with Paul, uh, I found uh, Robert Price's book on Paul to be the best of all that I read. Now, the of course, Colossal Apostle. The Colossal Apostle, and the reason why it's so good is because he he takes a textual critical approach and he looks logically at the issues that are discussed. For example, Romans. Let's take the, the book of Romans, for instance, which is a core doctrinal piece for Christian doctrine, as we understand Christianity, as you pointed out. Uh, Romans is not an it's not a letter. Like it's it's falsely attributed as a letter. Romans is not a letter. Romans is a treatise. A letter is one page of a paragraph. Like Titus is a letter, right? Philemon is a letter, perhaps. Romans is not a letter. Romans, Romans, First Corinthians, Hebrews, all of these texts that we have in the New Testament are very carefully contrived. Um, doctrinal statement type documents and they're very confusing so like one of the things that Paul gets confused uh, he confuses people because it sounds like he's contradicting himself all the time yeah. so Robert Price puts forth the argument goes around and then he says basically the opposite um, and, you know which is I think speaks to the, the redaction within the text that you right. know you have a corpus you have a statement then you have the various layers of redaction. Um, and so you don't have an authentic unedited letter, um, which speaks to um, kind of what you talked about earlier, but I always call what I call the, the Roman influence ca campaign or what I'll expand in my current definition, Greco-Roman influence campaign, because I would, I'm starting to kind of the, the, you know, the Greeks did come in, and they defiled the temple. But Ptolemy still commissioned uh, the Greek Septuagint. And I think that the cultural assimilation uh, didn't just start with the Romans, but it started with the Greeks. So with Ptolemy commissioning the Greek Septuagint, there are some alterations in the Greek Septuagint uh, that predate the Roman Empire. But as the Roman Empire took over the, you know, the, the Greek Empire, um, that Rome had a uh, maybe a more benevolent, like they'd accept the religion a little more and then introduce their their small alterations. So, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, delve too much into controversial stuff in, in the modern age, but uh, the idea that they would take, a, you know, the, the censorship, they would take the text, the religion, they would alter it. So we look at the Greek Septuagint, there are changes. Uh, and first, so the Greek Septuagint before Christianity gets a hold of it and then adds in all of, because the Greek Septuagint is the first five books that what Ptolemy commissioned. And then the rest of it, the, the writings and the prophetic work, a lot of those that become part of what the Christian Bible is based upon was produced in the Christian period and also included the Apocrypha. But I would say that there was... You know, to translate is delight, is why, you know, Jewish people read the text in Hebrew. Uh, when you have the power to translate, you have the power to influence. And so right. making little changes to the Greek Septuagint set the groundwork for what they did with the New Testament. So that it already started with the Greek Septuagint, that there was changes made when it was translated to Greek. Uh, and it's why you had separatist movements. When you look at the Maccabean period, you look at the you know, with the because the you know, as you know, there, you know, Sadducees, Pharisees, 
And then, you know, the other groups, the, you know, the Essenes and whatnot, you have the separatist groups to say the temple is on pure. We won't participate in an impure temple. We have the Sadducees who were very much Hellenized and they're part of the temple, but the, the Essenes won't participate because they feel like it's impure. Um, and then the Pharisees who are the rabbis who say they go back to the great assembly, which you know, before captivity, which would have been before the Maccabean period, but of course, is oral traditions, right? Uh, so, like, you know, the kind of the three main groups are are kind of through that period. Of course, the diverse, you know, we talk about the diversity of Judaism in the first century. Um, but there was, you know, when you look within the, the Greek Septuagint, um, that text, which was heavily played in the, the Roman Empire, and then how that played into the Platonic tradition and how henotheism began to rise in the Roman Empire. So before the advent of Christianity, henotheism, the idea of one God who is ethical, played heavily in the, the philosophical camps of Platonic thought because the Greek pantheon was full of gods who backstabbed and cheated. And it was very, you know, tumultuous, very human kind of thing, an idea of a God who is ethical, had morality, started to influence the philosophical camp. And all this kind of Hellenism that was, you know, one, it was a, they sought to influence and change the, the text and tradition of the Jewish people, uh, make it more secular, because Hellenization is essentially the secularization. Uh, and, and in that process, it influenced not just Jewish culture, but Roman culture and Roman philosophy, which laid the foundation for what I think Paul played to, because I think he played a lot on the ideas of Philo and maybe Josephus and some of the Platonic thought. And this is where the what was, you know, when I say the Greco-Roman influence campaign, I would trace it back to Ptolemy. And it's a process over centuries of influencing towards secularization. Um, and, and so I want to just, you know, I, I would even like, I backdate what I'm looking at even further. So when, you know, authors say that the new Testament was invented, you know, second century or fourth century, there's this groundwork of cultural assimilation for governmental dominance that starts before Christianity or the first century, um, so, and, and that's kind of my response to, like, you brought up the, the government influence upon the textual tradition, because really, they had the, the power to produce and distribute, and therefore, they can also censor and decide that the ones they want disseminated and not burnt are the ones that support their ideas. Well, there's no question. Yeah, I, I think that's very interesting what you're saying about Ptolemy. I, I know that so my view is this is i i think christianity and judaism and most of the ancient religions of the ancient world were drawing from the same pool of philosophical thought um i always find it interesting that you know like like so let me let me narrow that down that statement uh we have for instance thousands of years before Judaism, we have Buddhists, we have the followers of Krishna, and we have uh, at least documented at least hundreds of years, but full, I mean, we find Buddhist monks have went to China, we find shrines to Buddha in the British Isles before Rome got there. We find, in fact, that's largely what Rome was, once Rome Christianized and they went to the British Isles, when you look at the story of King Arthur, King Arthur, as we understand it today, largely is the tale of Rome trying to abolish and destroy uh, the Druids and the ancient religions of the British Isles uh, with their hero, uh, who represents Jesus Christ. And you have the Christianization of the British Isles, but but, the, but before the Christians got there, there were the sun worshippers. So we know Constantine was a sun worshipper, and we also know he was a Stoic. So Constantine was a big fan of Stoic philosophy because he felt, um, and I'm, I'm getting outside my pay grade by even discussing this, but just what I know from what I've 
you know, learn from others who are experts on Constantine. Uh, he liked the idea of the, you know, the serve your country, be a good citizen, be a good moral person ethos of Stoicism. Uh, he felt it was a good model for obedient Roman citizens. And so he liked Christianity. Uh, yeah, you find the Stoicism in Paul's writings and the pro-Roman. Absolutely. Well, so so back to that. Yeah, no, no question. Uh, so that's you know, we're in agreement on that. And I think when you so what you're what it sounds to me like what you're saying, I would synopsize like this: that it's not like there was a conspiracy to come up with texts that would manipulate people's minds to accept the Christian doctrine. Or for that matter, many of the ideas that get propagated, because even Rabbi Jonathan Sachs talks about Jewish Gnosticism in the early centuries and how it influenced. We know that Zoroastrianism heavily influenced the rabbis. Uh, the whole idea of heaven and hell and angels and demons and all that, that was absent in ancient Judaism. That comes in with the influence of Zoroastrianism and the Persians. So where did the Persians get it? Well, the Persians got it from the east. They got it from the from the from China and Tibet and all these monks that came over. We had we had we had Buddhist monks that were evangelizing in Judea a couple of hundred years before the Jesus story. So we also know that many of the stories, and it's shocking when you really dive into this, how much parallel there is, most of Jesus' life is directly, I mean, I'm not talking circumstantially, directly paralleled in the story of Krishna, the story of Buddha, um, and also, and, and, and you go into the ancient Roman Empire, and Mithraism was high, was a very popular religion at the time that Christianity was supposedly coming on board, and you also have other sects like the Isis cult, which uh, existed with some veracity all the way up into the 6th, 7th century in Rome. Um, the Isis cult was based, of course, in Egyptology. And when you go into Egyptology, if you want to talk the talk about the ancient origins of some of these ideas that monotheists hold dear, uh, Egyptology uh, has just like just like Buddhism does. Most people think Buddhism is a polytheistic. There's many gods in Buddhism, but there's one supreme god. And, uh, in, well, and in Egypt, it was the same thing. As a supreme god, whereas Hinduism. Um, so I would date like yeah, Hinduism Buddhism, too. Yeah, five hundred years ago. Um, I, I definitely would say the origins of Judaism predate Buddhism. Now Hinduism, uh, it may be equivalent time period from oh, from Buddhism, my... yes, but not Hinduism. Yeah, yeah Hinduism Buddhism. goes. Hinduism is probably the most ancient religion that we have that exists today still. Uh, there were there were missionaries for Hindus that went around the world. They sailed around the world. Uh, they had they had adherents, and and it comes in different names. Like if you go into uh, like Japan or China or Korea, uh, Buddha is known as Fo F O. Uh, if you go into the British Isles, uh, it's known as not Buddha. Um, um, it's not Buddha. It's the um, well, there is there is a Mahatma Buddha. I don't want to get into that because that's not the topic of this conversation. Uh, but I'm just trying to say that there were angels. All my only point is I don't want to get lost in the weeds here. Uh, is to your point is there was a there was a a very rich pool of theological and philosophical ideas that found ready acceptance uh in the early centuries in the roman empire and in judea as you mentioned like the hellenized movement there's a lot of these ideas that were very readily accepted already all of the ancient god men uh that existed in the ancient religions they almost all of them were dying and rising savior gods at some level mithra uh romulus uh even Isis had the had the whole resurrection story with Horus and all that, you know, a little different type story, but it's the same basic idea. And all of it ultimately seems to center around sun worship. So we know, for instance, that, like, for instance, the cross of the Christian thing, right? The cross is a symbol that goes way, way, way before Christianity. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, 
the Roman generals used to put the cross on their shields before Christianity was even an idea because yeah, it represented the sun. Yeah, like the image of the Cairo, which Constantine you know, uh, in, you know, invoked and put on his shields right. at Melvane Bridge or Melvane Bridge. Now, right, exactly. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, associate that with Sol Invictus, whereas right. the two later accounts, the two earliest accounts refer to Sol Invictus, whereas the two later accounts rewrite history and start saying that it was in the name of the cross, which it was right. not originally. Right, right, exactly. So that that's a great. I'm glad you said that. That that helps me cut to the chase here a little bit. That's what I was driving at. Is that so? The idea of a Christianity evolving. So my contention is this. This is my big pet peeve, and I know we're we're arcing towards this if we have time, towards the messianic movement. One of my big pet peeves, with and the reason why I make a point of saying I'm a mythicist is not because I really care whether Jesus existed or not, but it seems to be incredibly important to certain groups of people. Uh, when it comes to biblical scholars, I have my own opinion about that. I won't get into that right now. But for the Messianic movement, it is so critical for them to believe in a Jesus who was a rabbi, who walked the earth and taught these wonderful, cool things, and they love to make all these parallels with Talmudic thought and the thoughts of the rabbis. Um, and the problem with this is that I don't personally believe that Christianity has anything whatsoever to do with Judaism at all, exactly. at any level. Yeah. I don't think I don't think it connects to Christianity whatsoever. I mean, to Judaism whatsoever. Excuse me. Uh, so, especially once you understand. Uh, that Judaism was far from a, it was far from consensus in the first and second centuries about what Judaism was. What is Judaism? Like today, when we talk about Judaism, we think about the rabbis, we think about synagogue, we think about the temple, we think about the Talmud, we think about the rich tradition of Jewish philosophy. But that's, that's the centuries long development. Yes. Um, and most of it, and this is where, where I do see a parallel. Here's where I see a parallel between Judaism and Christianity. Is Talmudic Judaism and Christianity both developed side by side in an environment in which the origins of the story could not be verified. So by the time the Talmud was being written, the temple and Jewish society had been destroyed. So really, if you understand... What, what, is, what is rabbinic Judaism? The Talmud was designed to help people remain connected to their story of their people and to their religion without a temple and without a land. Talmud, Talmud is basically a diaspora, like here's how we live without what we're supposed to have. Yeah. Um, right? And so all of Judaism today exists in that perpetuity of a diaspora existence. Christianity, by the same token, uh, it, it, I think it's really convenient. I always think it's really convenient. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of background noise, uh, Jeremy. I don't know if it's coming from your end or not, but it sounds like somebody's playing bongo drums in the background. Um, I don't hear it my end at all. You don't hear it? I hear it. I don't know what it is. It's not coming from me. I mean, there's no motion. There's nothing here. I don't. Maybe it is uh, me. Maybe I hear a headset. I don't know. Oh, it could be my headset, yeah. I'll be, let me but, try to... Before we really get into all that, I want to lay some foundation uh, on some things, uh, sure. get some base understandings of defined terms before talking about things before the, so they don't get lost in the weeds to, to some degree. So, I mean, in, in general, yes, I agree with the summation kind of where you're going. Um, but I want to say, like, you brought something up. Um Judaism, there was diversity in the first century, but I wouldn't say that what became Christianity, you wanted to found Judaism that looked like Christianity in the fourth to eighth century. What was that? Can you say that again? I would say that there was a diversity of Judaism in the first century, but you wanted to have seen a Judaism in the first century that looked like Christianity in the fourth to eighth century. Right. So I would say yeah. there was a distinction. So sometimes people use that point 
to undermine Judaism and then say, kind of justify this later developed Christianity. So, so to backtrack, I want to kind of go into the first century and talk about the Judaism in the first century and where I would place what the followers of Jesus would have been in the first century in the context there before we define Christianity and before we get into like what Messianics are and stuff like okay. that. Sure. Uh, so sure. I think it really define Judaism in the first century and to contrast it from what later becomes, you know, for sure, Christianity, rabbinic Judaism, the, there's the foundation. There are some core things in Judaism, though, that all branches of Judaism share, and one is the Torah or the Chumash. And it's to the level that, one, they study, believe the Torah, the Chumash, the first five books. For, say, the Sadducees would have been more like Karaites today, I would say, if you were to, you know, give it a classification. Rabbis, oh, I, they... I would put, I would, just to interrupt you, I would put the Karaites more in line with the Samaritans. Okay. Well, but we can get into those definitions. And then... The Pharisees would have been the seedbed for rabbis. And then you have, you know, for sure, um, what the um, the Essenes or, you know, more separatist groups, the Zealots who were more of a violent, they were a political violent active version of the Essenes because they wanted to supplant and establish their Messianic king. Uh, and then Hellenistic Jews, which I, I would put the Sadducees in that Malay, and, and yes, there was a diversity of Judaism, but there's still the five first books of the Torah that they all shared in common. Uh, so there's a there's a core, you know, narrative myth that all, you know, th there's a diversity of, we, you know, application. Now, there are some of the, you know, the Hellenistic branches that blended me Merkaba mysticism and Platonic thought. You have the Essenes who, through ritual purity, felt like their ritual purity essentially took the place of temple sacrifice. They didn't participate in the temple because it was on pure. So there's a diversity of Hellenistic influenced by the influence by the Platonic thought. You have, you know, influences from mysticism within the Hellenistic branch. You have Essenes who have their own ascetic mysticism, which I would put those in two different categories. Um, and then you have, of course, the, the Sadducees, which are part of the ruling elite connected to the Roman leadership, uh, but also part of the temple. And then the Pharisees, which were more like the teachers of the people. Um, but there's a diverse, yes, there's a diversity of first century Judaism and diverging, you know, you have the Hellenists who they engage in Platonic thought and, and, you know, Merkava mysticism and, I feel like they share some of the same text we're looking at Enochian literature that you'll find within the, the Essenes. Now, as far as Pauline Christianity, I see them coming out of the Hellenist who, you know, looked at some of the same Enochian text, the Platonic thought, um, some of the mysticism, but different than the mysticism of the Essenes per se. But in the first century, yes, there's a diversity of Judaism, and there may be echoes of things later, like, you know, people talk about in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Pesherim, and, um, you know, the, the commentaries on Isaiah and Ezekiel and stuff like that, that may look similar to what later was used to develop Christianity, the eisegesis, the hopping through text to find support for a later developed tradition. Um, but all of this diversity of Judaism, I wanted the, still the idea of King Mashiach in the, would have been a king who rules physically in Jerusalem, not a savior. The idea of redemption was national redemption, not a savior of mankind. So even with all the diversity of Judaism, they would have agreed Mashiach is to help establish national identity, the kingdom of David. Um, it, it wouldn't have a, a, a sole savior. Uh, let me pause for one second. Um, hold on. Kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so there was a diversity of Judaism in first century. And I've seen that by Christian apologists. Why is my, hold on, let me turn my video on. 
Boom. So I've seen that used by Christian apologists to almost make it sound like there was a Christianity like we know it in the fourth the century and the first century, which I would not say exists, which I want to get to later. Not now, not yet. Um, but the diversity of Judaism in the first century still would agree that they wanted a king to establish national identity for the Jewish people and a Davidic king and a pure temple worship. Even the Essenes would have agreed that if there was a pure temple, they'd participate. Um, now, I don't know if the Hellenist would have bought into, you know, uh, that 100 percent. But, you know, the, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, I would say that they wanted a Messianic king to physically establish national identity and a Davidic king um, that that would have been an agreement, you know, bar none, except for maybe, you know, the Hellenized Jews, which that might have been a different situation altogether. But for a majority of what well, we Israeli centric Judaism, those within the land that were not overly Hellenized, they their their focus would have been the first five books you know, whether direct application or commentary of application, and then they want a king to establish national identity. And then you have groups that to varying degrees would focus on um, the prophetic well, books, the writings well, and stuff. But, to interrupt yeah. for one second, like the Karaites, for instance, what we know as the Karaites today, mm -hmm. would not have ascribed to any of that. Mm -hmm. They had no interest in a Davidic king. They didn't feel like I mean, yeah, there are later development, though. So, I mean, I, you can't superimpose them in the first century. No, but even at, at that time, I mean, ever since the split kingdom, uh -huh. there was a whole section of that ended up, you know, what we call the lost tribes. Uh -huh. uh, they didn't adhere to it. So, the, so Judaism, based in Judah, um, so a Jew is someone who follows the, the Davidic vision, uh -huh. if you will, whereas a Hebrew could be referred to any of the ancient Semites that would identify with Israel. So there's a lot of, I mean, even the Samaritans have their own Pentateuch. They have their own five. Oh books. yeah, absolutely. They have different so, interpretations. So still, of the still the, the focus would have been the first five books though. So I'm not, the, I'm not trying to sidetrack you. I'm just, yeah, no, there's st well, yeah, but still uh, the, the first five books would have been a major consensus. Sure. Period. Like even the Samaritans uh, who, they they would say that there's a different mount, a different temple, you know, that they, they focus on a different, you know, Jerusalem isn't the center for the Samaritans, but they still have a Pentateuch, a first five books, their own version. Um, but still, the first five books would have been central. And for a majority, a majority, um, especially in the first century in Israel and Judea and, and in the area where Christianity comes out of, Still, temple-centric Judaism with a Davidic king would have been pretty central to Israel. Not so much the Hellenized Jews and those outside. And I would not place, and I would say that the Essenes are a group we found a record of, but they aren't central to the Jerusalem in the area 100% that Christianity came out of. So there are these outlier groups the Hellenized and the Essenes and the Samaritans. But when it comes to the melee of Jerusalem centric, because, you know, Jesus went to the temple, uh, you know, within the tradition that developed. So I, I you know, I would focus on Jerusalem centric um, when it comes to now trying to piece together what happens. Now, Two major events you mentioned kind of in passing, and I'd add a third, and we don't have, like we've talked, we don't have the records. So 70 AD, destruction of the temple, the burning and the raising of the temple mound would include destruction of government structures, document and text. It would be a raising of the, uh, of the people. It, you're destroying the people in the land. And then again, the Bar Kokhba Revolt, 133, we're, we're going to do that again where we destroy the text and the tradition. So we don't have a good, authentic record of that period. Now, I want to couch what I think, and I'm going to start to couch well, what I think. Of just, to, just to mention, mm -hmm. all we do have is we have the government sponsor. Your, your voice history. dropped out. What did you do with your mic? Bring, there we go. Can you hear me? I don't know. Your voice went really, really low all of a sudden. Really? When you touched it, like all of a sudden, I went from hearing you to I could barely hear you. How about now? Um, still bad. 
I don't know. Your 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 volume just went really low. Really? Hold on a minute. Let me uh let's figure that out because I don't know why that would happen. Um it looks like it's still working on my end. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It's almost like you went from speaker mode to headset mode or something. Let me let me look at something here. I don't know. All I did was adjust my little microphone. Oh, nope, that's not what I want. How's this? Is that better? I don't know. Um, I'm curious if we should... Just pause it and figure it out. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's I pause. I, what, I think I'm having a walk. All right. So yeah, a little technical difficulty, but let me pick up where I was. So um, first century, um, we had the two main events. Uh, are you picking me up? Yeah, I hear you perfectly. Okay. I just saw your hand. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so where would I, here's where I would situate what the historical Jesus, which divorce this from what we're going to talk about, how Christianity invented itself. Or became to self-identify. I would put, you know, maybe drawing on the works of various, you know, Eisenman or Tabor and others. I, in my own personal research, I would place, even my recent conversations with Dr. Price, I would place the early followers of Jesus within the Zealot movement. I would put James and whoever Jesus was as part of those seeking to establish a kingly dynasty in Israel, um, pre the destruction of the temple, this is why I believe that Peter and James were cut off in 66 before 70, um, but they were part of a violent uprising to establish a Davidic king. And I don't, I don't know, I don't think I believe that Jesus was to be the king. But, you know, from my studies of that period of time, the early Ebionites may have seen Jesus simply as a prophet calling for an end of temple sacrifice, who wasn't resurrected, who wasn't born of a virgin, who had a physical father, Joseph. And I'm going to get into this a little bit but before kind of passing the mic. But um, I, I see evidence for an early, and then James may have, you know, took an over after he went away, but I would place them as part of what ended up with the Battle of Masada, the destruction there that led to the destruction of the temple. But I would place the early followers of the James Jesus movement as part of the zealot branch of the Essenes who wanted to violently overthrow. And we have no records, so we cannot disprove this, but it's very hard to prove because of the records. Now, I say that, and I think there is evidence when we look at the polemics and, and when it talks about at the Bar Kokhba revolt, they refused to participate because their revolt in 70 failed. And that is why they were made fun of at the Bar Kokhba revolt, because they, were, they had started to transition to what became rabbinic Judaism, a post temple religion. Uh, and so, my view of the historical Jesus before the myth-making of Christianity was they were zealots who fought for national identity, Davidic king, and failed. Now, and this follows the polemics, and I'm going to hit some points real quick. The polemics of the early church fathers, the big one that the majority of the groups they were polemic again were various Jewish Christian groups. Nazarenes, Ebionites, Corinthians, there was like four, five, six like a lot of their polemics was against Jewish Christian groups. The the proto-Orthodox and Orthodox, their main adversaries before there was Jewish Christian groups in that believed in Shabbat, kosher, you know, conversion. We can get into the the elements of that. Um, hold on, let me double check and make sure that we are recording. Yes, we're recording. Okay, yeah, yeah. Good. I think uh, I so the uh, main the main adversary of the early church father was the Jewish. We say Jewish Christians, but Christians really not the term to use for them. Uh, but it, because it became Christianity, it, it couches things for most people to understand. So I would say, and for me, and like even the last time I talked to Dr. Price, he he leans towards the zealot hypothesis. 
For me, I think that they were zealots and that we don't have that record. Now, I disagree with Eisenman, but agree that, you know, the teacher of righteousness was a James type character. The spouter of lies was a Paul type character. But I don't know if, they, I don't believe they're the same. I believe they're similar. Um, when we get into the Clementine literature, uh, the secret epistle of James, the epistle of Peter to James, what I see is a Judaism that teaches the textual tradition of the, because they talk about passing the scrolls, uh, the initiation according to Moses, the the 70 elders, you know, because we know of the tradition. So this is the rabbinic tradition, very pirke evoke kind of stuff. There's a Judaism, it, there's a Judaism that's very Jewish, and then they believe you must be circumcised, tested for a six-year period, and go through mikvah and a communal meal, and then you become part of this group. And this is a textual tradition of a group that believed that, it, from what I read about, is we'll talk about the later Ebionites, but the early Ebionites believed Jesus was a prophet calling for the end of temple sacrifice, um, and, and that he was cut off, but they didn't believe he was risen, savior, he was born of Joseph, not a virgin. Um, it, you know, and then later, I'd say in the second to fifth century, we see a Gnostic influenced Ebionites rising, and you see the Nazarenes, who I'd say split off with them. Now, the Nazarenes, I put their 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 splitting with the Ebionites around ninety, uh, common error, and I believe that's when the institution of the prayer of the Manim is put in the synagogues, and it's why Christians in the Talmud are called Nazarenes. And that there was a split between the Ebionites and the Nazarenes. Now, we have records that the Ebionites remained in synagogues up to the 8th century, uh, at least, you know, in polemic works. I mean, you know, and then they disappear. Like, maybe they just stayed Jewish. Who knows? But there's no definitive where they go. There's echoes here and there. Um, the authors that trace them, like, to the Cathars and stuff like that. But any of that is pure speculation. But to couch to what I think and what I'm trying to say here is that there was an early core group who stuck with the textual transmission around the first five books and the initiation according to Moses. Now, I put the historical James, Jesus, whoever may have been there, yes or no, not 100%, within that core group of the pre-Gnostic Ebionites, because, I, you know, the DDK, I'd say like fourth to fifth century Gnostic influences, uh, Nag Hammadi Library, where it has, you know, um, the writings of James and Peter that very Gnostic. Those aren't early first century works. So I would say that there was definitely this Gnostic branch who started to adopt Pauline ideas, though we know there were early Ebionites that saw him as a heretic and rejected the Pauline epistles. So that's where I see the early Jesus movement. And, and I'll give you a chance to, to answer to that. But now, if we are to move into the invention of Christianity, we go second century, and our textual tradition starts with, as you mentioned, Marcy. Before we get there, um, what do you make of, I guess, my summation of the early Jesus movement, connection to the zealots, you know, destruction of the temple, um, pre myth making of christianity yeah you make of like my summation of that uh there's a couple of points that struck me as you were going through that that i thought were really good um for instance like you talk about the minim prayer the 19th benediction in the shimona ashray um it's well known that there was 18 benedictions and the 19th was added yeah and it was against the minim you know that was the minim text it was the uh the the uh the cursing of the however you want to phrase it now if you talk to rabbis they'll tell you based on the sources that that wasn't directly a denouncement of christians mm -hmm. it was a denouncement of heretics in general mm -hmm. right and that's that's the jewish position on that uh yeah. right but i think what you say is very interesting as far as the, the break you know, that happened in 90 AD, uh, I think what you're saying sounds extremely plausible. Uh, and it, of course, would support what the rabbis say about it. But of course, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a Mississippi two-step 
with that yeah. because but it speaks to what you said originally which is the idea that we have as we discuss these ideas of christian origins it's probably worth us reiterating this that we're discussing it in the context that what is commonly understood as christianity today is post 4 500 ad Yes, and right. did not so exist in the first century. Right, so that's a really important thing to remind ourselves as we discuss this, because all these different elements that you're bringing forth are all way before that. So yes. I think I think a lot of times people take umbrage with these types of conversations because their their understanding of Christianity is is after there was a complete parting of all the ways, as it were, and. Yeah. and rabbinic judaism and christianity had gone completely in separate directions uh that's one thing that comes to mind as as you go through that another thing you mentioned which i thought was quite interesting uh it gave me a thought you mentioned eisenman uh and how he brings up and i know you know you and i have both read his book james the brother of jesus uh which we both recommend uh it's a it's a long read it's a, it's a slog uh but um at any rate, uh, he does talk about, of course, you know, we should probably reveal to the audience, for those who aren't familiar, that Eisenman believes that the traditional dating of the scrolls is inaccurate. Um, mm. And he has a he has a platform, we should mention, he has a platform to, to say this because he's one of the world's experts on the scrolls. He was yeah. instrumental in getting it brought forth to public viewing. Uh, he fought for that, whereas the Vatican wanted to lock it up and throw away the key. Uh, so he he knows the scrolls. He's viewed the fragments. He's studied them. He he was granted access that most people never had. So Eisenman is an expert on the scrolls. Uh, but his his uh, one of his big controversial claims, which caused a lot of controversy in the scholarly world, was the idea that the Dead Sea Scrolls are wrongly dated to two to three centuries before the destruction of the temple and Eisenman believed that the scrolls are contemporary with that time period. Uh, and he also believed, as you alluded to that the Paul of the new Testament, he, he speculated and we can't say anything more than that's what it is. It was speculation based on his study of the text and of the various, um, uh, uh, other writings such as the, uh, the Clementine traditions and, uh, that Paul is none other than the wicked liar pointed out in the scrolls uh but what you said that was interesting to me and i i put that all in subtext to what i'm about to say um is it's possible that eisenman could be wrong on both accounts and yet correct about the philosophical ideas that were germinating through the period Meaning yeah that's be, my point right i think that's what you were saying is that he could be completely wrong about the dating of the scrolls the, the, the consensus could be accurate and he could be completely wrong about fingering Paul as the wicked liar. And yet, even being incorrect, he could be absolutely correct as to the tension within the growing movement and what the, the various mm. controversies were. And I do believe he was yes. accurate about that, right? And that's kind yes. of what you're illustrating. So I I, mm. I do find that to be a very interesting analysis. Um, uh, I guess... I don't take exception to anything you're saying as far as, you know, disagreeing with it or whatever. Uh, I, I tend to think that, um, so if, if I could give a much shorter synopsis than what you gave just to move the conversation along. So I'm not yeah. bogging you down, but yeah, a, yeah. Shor a shorter synopsis of my take on the development of Christianity is I think all of these things are true. All of these developments in the ancient world, in, in Judea and in Rome, are all true. However, I think that what happened is that as time went on, I think the Jesus character as a story, the Jesus Christ that is known as the founder of Christianity, the one that Christians adore and worship and is nothing other than a, a recharacterization of an ancient mythological pagan story. Because the Jesus story that we're taught 
you know, this guy that is the son of God that defeats death and rises again. And, you know, and he's the morning star and he's the alpha and the omega and all this other stuff. You know, he has no beginning and no end. These are all motifs that existed long before any of these things we're talking about. And they've always existed as long as human history has been recorded. There has always been a desire for people to put up a hero that represents their mediation between death and the everlasting and that which we don't understand. So there's, there's always this need that people have to try to understand the mystery of it all. Like, why am I here, etc., and so forth, right? And to go back to something you said earlier, uh, so that I'm being consistent with what you're saying, you're absolutely correct. So a lot of people don't realize, Christians especially, that um, the idea of a savior figure, um, you know, what, what you say in Hebrew, a Mashiach, a savior, a Messiah, which the, you know, the Greeks and Romans took directly from the Septuagint and from Jewish tradition, is wildly different, as you pointed out excellently, from the Jewish conception. Except yeah. it's not. And where is it not? Well, in the in the parts of the Jewish population that were embracing the pagan world around them, the Christian idea of a redeemer figure was very consistent with whatever all their neighbors believed. They all believed in this type of a person, whether it's Mithra, whether it's Zoroastra, whether it's Krishna, whether it's Buddha, whether it's, you know, as we go down, down the line, all these different figures that all represent the same thing. They represent yeah, salvation. Right. And, and so Judaism, ancient Judaism, like, like the idea, for instance, I, I had, um, well, let me save that. Let me save the comment I was about to make because you're going to get to it eventually. I don't want to muddy the waters here. But yeah. so I very excellently put that that in Judaism, Mashiach is really a military political leader. Yes. That's what he is. That's what he is. And, and it's important to it's point out. In the first century, uh, for those in the land of Judea. Right. And, and, uh, Hellenistic Jews may not have felt exactly the same way, though. Well, this is where it gets complicated. And this is going to, we have to put a pin in this idea right here, because this, mm. when we get into the messianic thing, if we get into it in this conversation, or if it's a follow-up one, if we run out of Hopefully. time. We'll see, we'll see. Yeah, when we start getting into the Hasidic, Kabbalistic mm. conceptions of Mashiach, yeah. so there's, there, that has to be dealt with, because that's, that's the the Mashiach that the Messianics cling to. But in terms of Jewish law... We'll circle source, back to that one. Yeah, we will. The, the sources are very clear that there's certain jobs that a Messianic candidate must fulfill or they are disqualified as being the Messiah. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus doesn't fulfill any of them. No. Not one. So... The character of Jesus, this is why I have such an issue with people that want to die on the hill of Jesus' historicity. Mm -hmm. Because they're trying to contend for a Jewish guy who had these pure values and was a great preacher and he was a leader and he had all these wonderful ideas. And they're willing to throw out the virgin birth. They're willing to throw out the ascension. They're willing to throw out all the later Christian claims about this God-man. But they but they violently cling to this idea that there was a guy back there somewhere and he's just lost in the pages of the New Testament and all the redactions and everything. Well, my argument is always, what would be the point of that? Because even if there was this guy back there called Jesus, mm -hmm. he's still not the Messiah according to Jewish expectations. Yeah. So what's the point of a historical Jesus then? If all you're doing, and my favorite, my favorite uh, on this, uh, you know, I, I'll quote him again. Robert Price has the great analogy: nobody's interested in Clark Kent, except in relation to the fact that he's secretly Superman. If Clark yeah. Kent wasn't really Superman, who the heck is interested in Clark Kent? Nobody's interested in Clark Kent, the no. mild-mannered news reporter. 
And all these Jesus historians have never been about a Clark Kent or a single rabbi. Judaism's never been about one rabbi, right. one Clark Kent. Correct, exactly. But the, but the but the people who want to desperately try to connect Jesus to ancient Judaism are always they're always willing to make all these concessions because they want to distance themselves from Christianity. You know, because they, you know, oh yeah, Christianity became pagan and it added all this other stuff like the Easter story and everything. Yeah, we all understand mm -hmm. that. But if you strip Jesus of the New Testament down to just being some itinerant preacher wandering around gaining followers, you've just completely circumcised and uh, worse than that, you've castrated the entire religion of Christianity. You've made Jesus irrelevant. So the idea is the religion of Christianity has nothing to do with an itinerant preacher in Judea. It has everything to do with the self-interest of the various groups vying for power for the thought of the people. Yeah. And, and so that's where the door is opened to the Pauls of the world, whoever Paul was or if he even existed – Whoever wrote in Paul's name, which is largely what we have today, we have a bunch of documents written in Paul's name that have had cut and paste and scissor marks and stitch points all over them. We have very little core Paul, if there is any. And yeah. none of it, none of it existed in the earliest church records don't have any Paul. We don't mm. know of Paul except until after Marcion supposedly discovers his letters. Yeah, that's what. So, and we know that the Gnostics considered Paul to be a founder of their movement. Yeah. And so once, I mean, once even the early Proto-Orthodox considered Paul to be a heretic, the early Ebionites thought Paul was a heretic, and it wasn't until after Marcion found his letters, and then the Proto-Orthodox decided to massage and revitalize them, and then redact his letters further, that all right. of a sudden Paul was a revival. Well, this was another excellent podcast with uh. Author David LeBlanc, um, we got into some really good topics. It did kind of run a little bit long, so I ended up cutting it in two pieces. So thanks for tuning into this first part, and make sure you tune in next week for the second part. And um, you know, for everybody following, make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, you know, tune in at Jesus the Jew within Judaism.com, the Facebook group, and YouTube, and uh, stay in touch for uh, further episodes.